there is an important concept for risk management of medical devices, but it's also difficult and challenging to do in practice. I'm talking about benefit risk analysis or benefit risk ratio. Now, this is a key requirement of ISO 14971, the international standard, and also EUMDR, which just went into effect last month. Now, did you know that the term benefit risk appears 28 times in EUMDR? So it's important and for good reason, because regulatory authorities all over the world, they evaluate the safety and effectiveness of your medical device by looking at the benefit risk analysis information. So it's important to know what they're looking for, what the requirements are, and also important to do it right. Hello everyone, I'm Naveen Agarwal, and I wanna welcome you all to my weekly video update. Now this topic of EUMDR requirements for benefit risk was the focus of a recent interactive Q&A session that we do every month. Now for those of you who may not be familiar, this is a monthly get together of uh, medical device industry colleagues, very informal get together where we talk about different topics related to medical devices, focusing on risk management, but also other quality and regulatory related topics. There are recordings of our past sessions on my YouTube channel. You can look them up and I invite you to join us if you are interested in learning more about the industry or you might have your questions of your own. They are very informal and casual. You can follow my LinkedIn feed if you are on LinkedIn because that's where I make the announcement or you can visit my website www.exceedqm.com. There's a web page for Q&A sessions and you can register for free. So in this particular session, we focused on EUMDR requirements and we also talked about an overall framework of key factors you should consider. Now this is a difficult activity and there's a more detailed video that you can find on my YouTube channel, which actually presents a case study example of how to do it. And you can find that on my channel. But in this particular video, I will focus on the requirements that we discussed, uh, give you a little bit more perspective about how to understand them and also give you an overall framework of key factors. Benefit risk analysis requirements in EU MDRs are extensive. As I mentioned before, it appears 28 times, but look at how they have defined the term in the regulation. Benefit risk determination means the analysis of all assessments of benefit and risk of possible relevance for the use of the device for the intended purpose. So that's the key word. It's in the context of intended purpose or intended use, which you would have defined early on and would have uh, evo it would have evolved during your design and development before it got finalized, right? All your IFUs should be based on intended use. So this is important. So benefit risk is in the context of intended use. Now in Annex 1, there are specific requirements to reduce all risks, AFAP, which is as far as possible, without adversely affecting the benefit risk ratio. Now this term ratio can be very confusing and I will talk about that in a little bit. Evaluate impact of post-market data of benefit risk ratio. So expectation is that you will do it continually and see how the benefit risk is changing over time. Because the intention and expectation is to minimize all known and foreseeable risks and undesirable side effects within the context of the benefit risk on an ongoing basis. That's why post market, link to post market becomes important. Article 61 specifically requires the acceptability of benefit risk ratio be based on clinical data, not conjecture, not hypothesis, not speculation, but actual data. And that's why you should look up requirements for clinical evaluation in Annex 14 and clinical investigations in Annex 15 to be able to prepare how you will gather this information. Article 86 requires PSURs, which are periodic reports, to provide conclusions of the benefit risk determination. Hopefully they will evolve over time as new information becomes available to you and your conclusions will evolve. So the expectation is these PSURs will highlight these emerging conclusions. Article 88, reporting of statistically significant increases in the frequency severity of incidents significantly affecting benefit risk. So that's an ongoing monitoring but the emphasis is on a statistically significant increase. So it depends on how you want to set it up, but some ana analytical approach is required. Annex 2, 
Technical documentation must include the benefit risk analysis for all these annexes. And Annex 3 technical documentation for post market surveillance requires PMS plans, post market surveillance plans to include suitable indicators and thresholds for benefit risk. That means you need to plan ahead. If it's a new product, hopefully you will have more stringent requirements, more frequent monitoring to be able to gather the information that you need. So your PMS plan should reflect that particular approach and it may be a different approach for a legacy product. So as we see, there are very extensive requirements on EU MDR scattered all over the place. But here's the big picture. The big picture is in your risk management process, you have to first reduce all the risks, known and potential risks, to as far as possible within the context of benefit risk and intended use. And you have to continually monitor them through post-market surveillance data, for which you will need the post-market surveillance plans and document them. You should make the acceptability decisions on clinical data during development and post-market data when it is the product has been launched using statistically sound approaches. Okay, so those are analytical approaches that you have to implement and adopt. And finally, you should document that as part of your technical documentation. CERs will probably expect that and PSURs will be expected. Clinical evaluation, clinical investigation should be based on some planning of how you would gather the information to be able to determine benefit risk. So that's the overall big picture. Now let's look at a very broad framework of key factors that you may consider for benefit risk analysis. Analyzing benefit risk is a balancing act and it requires a significant amount of judgment based on technical experience. Now this framework of key factors came from the FDA. There is actually a guidance that you can look up and they provide these key factors. So at a high level, what are the factors you can look at for evaluating benefits? What's the type and magnitude of the benefit? Is it life critical, life saving, or is it just a temporary relief? Who benefits, how many? How long does the effect last? Like we mentioned, is temporary or permanent? How likely patients will experience one or more benefits? So this is the benefit side of the story. Factors evaluating risks are type and number of harmful effects. Maybe you have information from the clinical studies or you are gathering information through post-market surveillance. That's why you have to keep monitoring that risk profile over time. Severity and prob probability of harmful events. That's part of your risk management process and duration of the harmful uh, events. As you gather post-market information, pay attention to the intensity with which certain report is reported to you. Uh, it may not just be a number, it may be actually a pretty big impact to that specific patient. Finally, other considerations, uncertainty in estimating benefit risk. You have to be mindful of that because in the beginning, maybe you don't know much about the product, its benefit and risks, and you have to wait for the real world information to flow in. Your uncertainty is high and over time it'll get better. So that uncertainty should be reflected in your post-market surveillance plan. Patient perspective is important. For somebody, they may be able to tolerate a higher level of risk because they don't have any other choice and they consider the benefit to be much higher in terms of their quality of life. But for others, that may not be the case. Alternate treatments, other medical devices or other therapies, you have to compare your benefit risk from that perspective. Novelty of technology, risk mitigation post-market data. So if the technology is novel, probably it is going to lead to a much bigger impact, much bigger benefit, but also carry a lot of risk, a breakthrough device or something going through the de novo process with the FDA. You can certainly have a conversation of striking the right balance between the amount of information needed post-market and pre-market. You could do that. So this is an overall framework, right? N it should be based on quantitative analysis, but let me visit the issue of benefit risk ratio as it is mentioned in the regulation. Ratio typically implies a number, numerator divided by a denominator, maybe a magnitude of benefit divided by magnitude of risk. That's not the right way of understanding what they're asking for, because it is not possible to come up with a single number. You could have as much quantitative analysis as possible but most likely you will end up with a semi-quantitative approach. 
maybe a couple of tables, maybe a scale going from low, medium, high on these benefits factors and risk factors. And you will do an aggregate analysis with a commentary about your overall assessment of benefit risk analysis. Uh, I would not understand or interpret the requirement as having to report a single number because if you follow that approach, most likely you will be incorrect. And secondly, it will not help you to really evaluate and monitor on an ongoing basis what is going on. It is better to have a comprehensive approach using these factors and prepare some kind of a semi-quantitative uh, approach supported by evidence and clinical evidence. Again, as I mentioned, I have a, a video that goes through a case study approach of uh, benefit risk analysis. You can look into that. It is semi-quantitative, but they, um, there is example in that example, there is a way to quantify some of the benefits and you may use a similar approach. Finally, I hope uh, um, you saw that there are extensive requirements in EUMDR and they are emerging all over the world. ISO 14971 is just an indication of what's happening in our industry. Technology is changing fast and as such, regulatory expectations are also evolving very fast. And benefit risk is essential to getting it right. Uh, but also I would say, don't wait for perfection. Do the best you can, but have a plan in place to continually evaluate and monitor what's going on based on your post-market surveillance. I hope this makes sense, but if you have any questions, please leave a comment here or engage with me on LinkedIn and let's have a discussion. But if you like, you can also join our interactive Q&A sessions and bring that up because there are many other experts with many years of experience in that forum and you can learn from their insights and experience. And in, in turn, you can also share your specific insights. So I invite you to check that out.